Hey, what's going on everyone? Mecha here and welcome back to the biggest tier list, at least the biggest Fire Emblem tier list as far as I'm aware of. Today we're going to finish another three Fire Emblem games, so get another three steps closer to making that giant tier list of every single character in every single Fire Emblem game. The reason I make these videos is the reason I'm able to make videos and that's my Patreon. They submit the characters here and I put them on the list and talk about their utility or my experiences with them and I tier them roughly based on how good they are in like an efficient setting. So if you're into that, you know, feel free to tune in, uh, listen to this in the background, it should be fun. Um, so I got some Fire Emblem Gaiden for you today, over here. Uh, we got Sonya, Dean, and Clive. For FE4, I've got Ira, Hannibal, and Corporal. For FE7, I've got Bartray, Wallace, and Lin. In Fire Emblem 9, Path of Radiance, I have Tabarn, Nasala, and Nazir. And for Shadow Dragon, I've got Frey, Edsel, and Nagi. And then afterwards, for next episode, we're going to have some new mystery, and I think some awakening, and some conquest and birthright left for you guys. So, let's get into it. Alright, I almost forgot that Matilda was here as well, but thankfully I double-checked my spreadsheet, and here we go. She's on here. So, uh, Sonia and Dean were submitted by Arkholt, and then Clive and Matilda were submitted by Peeved. Uh, now, I know for a fact that P submits characters uh, while knowing he knows more about the FE2 meta as far as there's one. Uh, I guess he just wants to hear my thoughts before correcting me on them, which is completely fair and fun. Uh, but yeah, with Sonia and Dean, the split route characters that you're probably knowing from SOV, uh, like before, I prefer to kind of compare characters from Gaiden to Echoes because it's a game that more people know. And it's also easier for myself because I'm more familiar with Echoes right now than, SO than Gaiden because, you know, SOV is a remake of uh, Gaiden that I've played more recently. Um, Sonia and Dean, I don't think are too different between SOV and FE2. There are some differences, of course. Uh, but generally, I think they'll end up in roughly the same area. Sonia is, of course, a mage recruited pretty late into Act 3 for Celica. Uh, you will probably generally go the same route that you would in SOV, which is going towards the right side of her route before you go up towards the Mila Temple. So you'll probably get Dean and Sonia, or Dean or Sonia, uh, before you go up there. And the biggest problem for Sonia, I think, is basically just everything that mages have to deal with, as well as unleveled characters. Uh, joins at a pretty low level of 5, uh, the same level as Dean. Uh, but Sonia is a female mage, which means she doesn't reach promotion until she reaches level 20, which is super hard to get in Gaiden, especially on normal mode, but even on easy mode, it's just no easy feat, you know, despite the name. Uh, it doesn't help that mages only have four movement to go around, and, you know, mobility not a super big deal overall, if you can compensate for it somehow, uh, like with really good combat compared to everyone else, but she doesn't have that either. She's probably one of the worst combat units you have for, you know, direct damage dealing, like just surviving on enemy phase, um, enemy phasing in general is just kind of hard when she's so fragile and doesn't really, I don't remember exactly what she doubles and what she doesn't, but I don't remember being particularly impressed at the one time I used her in Gaiden. Uh, I'm pretty sure I always prefer Pink Dean in this case. He's much easier to use. Uh, Sonya has got some big trouble. I've always found her spell is pretty interesting. I think it got buffed in SOV because she really doesn't have that much that uh, sets her apart uh, compared to other units. Uh, in Guidance, she joins with Fire, Thunder, Excalibur. Excalibur is, of course, great, don't get me wrong, but it's like the baseline of what you need to be good. Uh, but it doesn't exactly give you a niche of its own. Like, it's not like, for example, Physic on Jenny or Warp on Silk, where it really just makes you a completely different character than everyone else you've got. It's just a damage dealing spell. Uh, a good one, but just damage dealing nonetheless. A uh, level 14, she gets Seraphim, but that's already nine levels in. Uh, I can't overestimate how hard it is to get a unit like this up to a high level. Uh, even though mages are supposedly getting an XP bonus, uh, that's what I first thought when I was looking into these characters for a little bit. Uh, apparently it's mostly meant to differentiate them from male mages, but it doesn't really give him a whole lot of XP overall. Like, she gains XP roughly at the same rate as someone like an armor knight or an archer, for example, from what I can tell. So that doesn't help her a whole lot. And on promotion, she doesn't even get anything super spectacular, she just gets recover. Um, funnily enough, I noticed that she promotes to priestess, which is the same class as Celica, so... It's probably not intended, but it looks like she just kind of becomes Celica upon promotion, which is not a very good sign for you. Uh, other than Seraphim, she gets Sagittate level 18, which is... I mean, it's a funny spell, uh, but that's about it. That's all it does. Um, but yeah, her stats are just not very good at base level. Uh, another funny thing about Sonya, she has 30% growth in every single area except Resistance, which is zero because this is Gaiden. Everyone is zero in everything. Everything else about her, 30%. Um, but base is not too great and can't really do a whole lot. Can't really move very far. Can't fight a whole lot. Uh, I'm not sure if she's at, like, I'm not sure if she's the worst character in the game, but she might be. we got some characters left. We actually got a fair, highly high amount of them. I'm not showing it on screen right now because it looks kind of ugly in Tearless Maker and the way my overlay looks. Um, but she might just be the worst character in the game. 
There might be... Maybe... I Honestly, I might call Jesse better than her too, because he joined slightly earlier, can still promote to Myrmidon, maybe do something, have some semblance of durability. That's my experience mostly with SOV more than uh, Gaiden, because I never used Jesse and Gaiden. Uh, but yeah, that's where I put Sonya, probably. Uh, F, maybe E. Uh, like, I'm trying to think of like what makes her that much uh, worse than uh, Forsyth, but I think Forsyth is honestly, you can still make him work more easily than you can make Sonya work. Now, Dean is um, kind of the same as he is in SOV, where if you already have a Dread Fighter, you probably won't need a whole lot more than them, although it can be helpful to have multiple units to enemy phase at one range sometimes, or at least bait over Dark Mages. So in that sense, you might have more use for a dark, another Dread Fighter in this game than you do in Shadows of Lentia. Uh, but I think functionally, he's mostly the same as Saber and Kamui, where it's like, okay, if you didn't have like a Dread Fighter at this point, you might as well go for Dean. He's level five Myrmidon, so it's five level the Dread Fighters. You can probably get him an XP well at some point to boost his level up a little bit. And you just have a semi-free low maintenance dread fighter to work with and you'll get up to the dread fighter bases uh, dean has like a pretty good speed base of itself and it gets buffed up by the dread fighter bonus uh, he starts with 17 he goes up to 18 when he promotes at the very least uh, there's a chance he'll reach that by himself of course but he only has a 15 percent growth so there's a good chance he's not going to get a single point of well basically anything um, as he goes up to uh, dread fighter uh, i say anything i actually think that gaiden does force hp level ups if you are forced to not level up anything um, so he's probably not going to get nothing, but it'll be pretty close. Uh, but yeah, Dreadfighter bases are pretty good. They double just about everything. Uh, they actually have a rest stat. I don't remember if they have any magic damage like they do in SOV, but I do know they're some of the best units to use on player phase to fight Dark Mages. Especially because in SOV you do not have the... Or in, Echo, in Gaiden, you do not have the option of um, using a Killer Bow, Hunter's Volley combo or something like that, or no double line, stuff like that. So you have less options to just nuke everything on enemy phase. So someone like Dean looks relatively better off compared to the other units, I think, in Gaiden than he does in Echo. So in that sense, it might be more sensible to move Dean up further than I did in SOV. Uh, one thing you might have noticed if you're a close follower of the show is that I merged the tiers, uh, or more precisely, I merged all the plus and minuses. So you should have like S plus, S minus, A plus, I minus. And I think I also have B plus, B minus. I delete those because honestly, SOV cast isn't very big and I didn't think the gaps between units were big enough to warrant having a plus and a minus tier. So I just kind of presented them in one tier like this. Um, so I think Dean is fine in the B1, um, probably above these. Um, we got Selic over here, pretty sure this is Python. Uh, arguably better. I'm gonna double check that that's Python, but Gaiden, Gaiden portraits always confuse me. I'm pretty sure we got a Python over here. Nope, different dude. Who do we got over here, dude? Who's that? Who's that dude? Oh, there we go, it's Leo. I was close. I was actually pretty close to what it was. It was the bad archer, but the other route. Okay, Leo... I think it's pretty all right for Selecker up, but it takes him a long time to get going. Uh, Dean might be better for utility. I'll just go ahead and put him here. I feel like a low maintenance dude is better than what Leo can do in, in Gaiden. But honestly, Leo is kind of like one of those characters you kind of just got to use because he's the only way to counter some of the enemies that you encounter. And he's not as great as he is in SOV, but he still works out. Uh, I think I got SOV Leon like the top of this uh, tier. So I think two tiers below that is fine. Uh, I do think him being here, Dean being here above... Uh, Tatiana makes sense because Tatiana is really high maintenance. She's really good when she gets like going, but uh, the investment you put into her is higher. Payoff is arguably higher, but I think the balance is generally more in Dean's favor. All right, and then we have Clive and Matilda, uh, the power couple. I looked into Clive. I looked, like I would say a lot of research for <laughs> for what I usually do into Clive because um, I wanted to compare him to how he's in SOV because I really like him in SOV. I think I got him in like A plus somewhere or at least in a pretty high region. I was like, you know what, how good does that compare? Uh, can he do the same things he can do in Gaiden as he can in SOV? Uh, a couple big differences for him in particular, I think, are that in SOV, first of all, uh, he has supports to work with, I guess, but more importantly, there are forges that make him really good. Uh, the Rider's Bane in Forge especially is huge for Lance users like him on Alma Route, where you have the Rider's Bane. So uh, having a forged uh, Rider's Bane to want to kill enemy Cavaliers with can be really huge, or just one round KO them. So I checked a 0% growth efficiency run by uh, Velkama, and I noticed that um, I think it was Lucas as a knight was fighting the 3-5 uh, Cavaliers, 
and I noticed that he wasn't one at KOing, which was weird, because according to my math, a base Clive, who has less strength than Lucas, should be able to one at KO the enemy uh, Cavaliers. I was like, what's up with that? I checked this, uh, this Rance Force formula, and where it said, okay, uh, well, effective might works as following. Uh, in most games, it works like this, right? Uh, you got a horse layer with, say, nine might, it gets doubled or tripled, and then you add that to strength, and then you just, it's just a normal battle formula. Um, the power of minus the enemy defense, that's how much damage you do. Uh, but I thought, from what I saw in the formula as Rance Forest, uh, it was actually that uh, not just your weapon might, but also your strength gets factored into effectiveness. So, for example, if you have 10 strength and then a 3 might weapon that's effective, uh, you would get 39 effective damage because um, the strength gets factored in as well. So you get your strength tripled when you're using an effective weapon effectively. Um, and Gaiden is effective damage times 3, and that's how it was listed in Strength Forest. But it turns out the formula only went for the Falconite Slayer effect. So units like Est, Pala, and Katria, they get to triple their damage output against enemy monsters, uh, or zombies, or undead, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, but the same does not go for the Night Killer. It just doesn't say that on Strength Forest. Uh, but the Night Killer, while it deals effective damage, it's only the might that gets tripled, and not the strength. So that's how I learned that, and that's how I figured out why Lucas wasn't one of the KOing enemy Cavaliers, even though, according to the formula, he should be able to. Um, because the Night Killer is also like slightly heavy, I think that's why Clive wasn't really doubling, uh, or actually what they were using Lucas, but the point is, I don't believe Clive can really get enough speed to double with the Rider's Bane, and I don't think he can get enough strength to one round kill without it, which I think that chapter in particular isn't super important, but it's one of those chapters where Clive's utility in particular stands out a lot, and if he's worse there, then he's probably worse all around um, compared to SOV. So that's why I think I wouldn't put him as high as I was going to put him there. He's like A plus there. And I kind of want to put him like around C somewhere. Uh, he can still do the good thing where he can get to level 10 before a lot of other units and promote to Gold Knights or rather, you might, might not get there like super before other units, uh, but it's viable for him to become a Gold Knight and make use of the use promotion bonus that he gets out of it because you are boosted to class bases. Uh, his normal bases are pretty modest. Uh, Paladin bases are kind of good for the time that he gets them because he joins a level 6 Cavalier. Uh, you just get to give him one level uh, for the tiny bit of Act 1 that he's around in. Uh, then he's level 7 uh, Cavalier, can promote it to Paladin, and he'll get like 8 speed, 8 defense, uh, 28 HP. Honestly, it's not his bases are not much lower than that, but it gives him an RNG proof uh, level that he's at. Uh, I like having high mobility. I don't think it's super great um, in SOV. Uh, and I also don't think it's super great in Gaiden, uh, but in Gaiden in particular, you have an infinite range warp, so someone like Lucas, who has pretty good attack power, but not much mobility, you can compensate for low mobility by just warping him wherever he needs to go. Uh, but someone like Clive, you don't have to warp him, which means you can warp other units. So in a way, the mobility works out. Uh, not having to warp someone is kind of nice. Uh, Silk so generally only gets one or two warps in a chapter before you would have to Nosferatu tank, um, because there's no real way to heal her other than using Nosferatu for, for Gaiden, you don't have Fae to heal her. Uh, so in a way, Clive being able to get to enemies is nice, but only if you can actually do something. If he doesn't really do anything against these enemies, he has to run back and get healed, he's honestly hurting you more than he's helping you. Uh, you're better off just sending a good combat unit like Almor Lucas in that direction. Uh, but from what I can tell, Clive can sort of do something, uh, not near equal what he can do in, in SOV, but good enough to where he's still like worth deploying and using every now and then. So I want to put him like the low end of B, maybe the high end of C. Uh, I do believe that um, Zeke will outclass him when you get him. Uh, I'm gonna double check that though. What are his bases like? Um, yeah, Zeke has like way, way better stats at base than Clive has at base, or even when he's like a gold knight. Uh, let me check the gold knight bases just to see how high he gets. Well, actually Zeke's stats are not that far above the gold knight bases. So if you do get him, to Gold Knight before Zeke joins, I'd say he's still a better unit between the two because, uh, so Zeke, for example, just to give you an idea, uh, he has like eight, 40 HP, which is the same as Gold Knight base. Uh, he has two more attack than Gold Knight base, six, six more skill than Gold Knight base, which is kind of whatever, uh, two more speed. Uh, like they're better all around, but not by so much that I would call him better. So if you can get Clive to Gold Knight before Zeke joins, then he's definitely the better unit. So I'm okay with the tier difference because of course, Zeke does only join in Act 4. Uh, whereas Clive is like all game out long to help you out. Uh, then Matilda, I think Matilda is harder to get to Gold Knight because she joins a level 1 Paladin halfway through Act 3, whereas someone like Clive is going to be a Paladin before Act 3 even starts, so we'll have a bit of a level lead over Matilda in that way. And also her bases are just worse. This is basically the same that they do, uh, or like the same that they compare in uh, SOV, it's just 
Matilda's is a bit more underleveled. Um, she does have 10 base res, which is really used against mages. Uh, she has the same thing going on in SOV, where she's just much safer against dark mages. Not a whole lot safer. You do, ha you do have to heal her at some point, because she only has 26 HP, which is fairly low compared to what a... Uh, well, Gold Knight would have a lot more, but he's not a Gold Knight by then. Um, how much HP would Clive have at that point? I'm just comparing her to Clive, because it's just a logical jump-off point to compare the two to. Where's my Clive base is at? There he is. Okay, so he also has 26 base HP, but it goes up to 28 when he goes Paladin. He might proc HP once or twice. So he doesn't have... He has a bit more, but not a whole lot more. And his res is much worse. Uh, he only has one base res. So, Matilda would be a lot better against mages, actually. Um, which almost doesn't fight you very much after Matilda joins, which is, there's always like one or two. And it's nice to have someone to weaken them. So that's pretty useful, actually. I kind of like that. And then offensively, she has 12 base attack, which is pretty solid, and 12 base speed. I kind of like that. It's just It takes a long while to get from level 1 Paladin to level 10 Paladin and then promote to Gold Knight compared to where Clive is at. So I will put her a bit lower. Uh, I think a tier difference might be warranted. I do think she might be worse than Zeke though, uh, but I do think she's better than Mei and Python and the whole squad over here. So I think this is a solid spot for her overall. She seems helpful. I kind of like using her. I remember it's been a long while, but I kind of liked using her back when I had her. Just not as much as uh, some of the units up here. Uh, but units in Guiding, you kind of need them all <laughs> to get through, I feel like, because they're all force deployed and they're all kind of, eh, compared to their SOV counterparts, especially the, the archers. So the more help you have, the better. And honestly, if you had the choice, you probably wouldn't undeploy them anyway. Uh, but Matilda, definitely one of the better ones when you have her. It's just the lack of availability. And then uh, long term, you do need to like invest into her to keep her viable, I think. Uh, that's why she's only in a C tier. But I could see B. And I could also see Clive being higher. Uh, if he's a little bit better than expected. I kind of want to replay Gaiden now. <laughs> Not gonna lie. It's, it would be my fourth or fifth time, but I kind of want to replay Gaiden now, just because it's so silly. Uh, we have a lot of Gaiden left after this, though. So, um, I think like about seven, eight, nine, ten characters, roughly. Uh, minus a couple uh, bosses. Yeah, we got plenty of, to, of Gaiden to go. Uh, let's move on to FE4. Alright, next up we have Genealogy of the Holy War, the last three playable characters in that game. Uh, we have Ira, submitted by Modi. Uh, I think there was some confusion about whether it was Ira or her daughter Larce. When you have them side by side, it really becomes how very apparent how similar their portraits are. Uh, in fact, I shouldn't have put them next to each other at all because I almost got lost again. Uh, Hannibal, submitted by Jonathan. And uh, Corporal wasn't submitted by anyone in particular, uh, but I was like, you know what? It's the last character, and someone else later on submitted a character that was already there. Uh, Medea was double submitted. So I was like, you know what? We can just make sure that we finish off FE4 now, and that way we'll be done with that game, and that will compensate for the one character that was double submitted. So there we have it. Um, so Corporal was my submission, I guess you could say. I'm, a, I'm my own Patreon. I pay myself a lot of money, in fact. Okay, so Ira, uh, there's not... A whole lot to say about sword twins in FE4 that I haven't already said, but just in case you missed the last 25 times, um, these units are really, really fun to use and really, really good in, you know, one-to-one -one combat generally. Uh, but the issue with that for efficient playthroughs is that for one, the demand for really, 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 really good combat is pretty low because almost anyone can get really, really good combat or really, really good, really good combat or whatever number of reallys you want to say. And it'll generally be overkill because the enemies in FE4, they are bulky and they're sometimes kind of strong, but your own characters are so, so much stronger. Especially in Gen 2, where you have all those overkill crit weapons, but even within Gen 1, uh, you have the tools you need to beat down enemies very efficiently uh, on your mounted units, especially, uh, especially Sigurd, of course. Um, so you have to slow down significantly in order to use Ira at all in Gen 1, especially considering uh, how fast-paced Chapter 2 is, uh, Chapter 3 to a lesser extent, but still. It's hard to find anything for her to do that is not self-improvement. Uh, now that is important to do in a ranked run, but this is not a tier list that's in the context of a ranked run. It's just in context of you know trying to play the game somewhat fast, not balls to the wall LTC, uh, but pretty fast in general. And in such a case, I don't see what Ira really contributes uh, more than any of the other sword twins here, like uh, Holin, uh, Larce, uh, Ulster, uh, or even these guys. They're not even that far removed from the substitutes. So I would put it like like below Holin above the Sword Twins from Gen 2 seems probably fine, because I think in Gen 2 they're even more overkill in combat, and so is the competition, so they're even less relevant. Uh, but honestly, you can go anyway with these uh, Sword Twins. They're not great, but they're really fun to use. Um, Aster's always fun. Uh, one cool thing that Ira can do that I should give her some credit for is baiting Jamka. She's probably the best at doing it. Uh, still not 100% safe, because Jamka is scary like that, but Jamka, like, 
murders your units, including Sigurd. He just completely destroys them most of the time because he's got Pursuit, he's got Adept, he's got uh, a cost, and he's got a chance to crit you with the Killer Bow. And Ira is immune to a lot of these things. She's fast enough to not get doubled by the Killer Bow uh, by Jamka because her speed stat is just higher. She can use lighter weapons if you need to. I don't believe she needs like anything lighter than the Iron Blade, maybe the Iron Sword, but that's about it. Uh, she has Nihil, which prevents crits from happening. So the only way that Jamka is going to like double her is a cost or a depth, which, you know, they can still activate, but it's the safest it gets. You don't need to face Jamka in combat, I believe, to recruit him safely. But I think to do it at the fastest rate possible, um, you do need to face him at least once. And you'll probably have to do that with Sigurd if you're going to the fastest pace possible. But there might be some way to work in Ira to make it a bit safer if you're slightly slowing down. So that is something I will give her credit for. Other than that, there's not a whole lot that she can do very well. She's a little bit fragile, and she relies on Aster to get one-round kills at first. Uh, when she's grown a bit or gotten some better weapons, particularly the Hero Sword, uh, she can one-round by herself. But the thing about FE4 is that anyone can one-round with the Hero Sword. And even though Ira is the first one to receive it, she's not necessarily the one who is the best at keeping it around. Because there's units that can use the Hero Sword that can see more combat than her, either because they have more mobility or more durability or both. And you just want the hero sword to see as much action as possible. Uh, not just because it kills almost everything it touches, but also because you want to build up kills on it so that it can get crit and get even more overkill so you can kill bosses with it. Um, so that's why hero sword Ira is generally not the most efficient strategy. Uh, but I respect that it's the one that almost everyone does because she's the one to receive it in the first place from either Lex or Holen in Chapter 3. So it makes sense that people often conflate the utility of the hero sword with Ira's utility. And they see her use that hero sword and attack like 40 times in one round of combat uh, through all sorts of shenanigans. Uh, it is a really good weapon, so I'm not surprised that Ira has a really high reputation among people playing FIFA for the first time. Um, but, you know, when you get into um, how can I efficiently play this game, uh, she kind of falls short in that regard. Uh, doesn't mean she's not fun to use, though. Uh, then we have Hannibal. Um, often seen as one of the worst units in FE4, and I don't blame anyone seeing him that way. Uh, I like them a lot personally. A lot of people think I only like multi units or only like units that are really good or units that I only have pursuit or units that are most efficient. Uh, I actually enjoy Hannibal because I enjoy characters that can use almost any weapon for one. And Hannibal is, I think, the only character that at base can use swords, lances, axes, and bows. They just kind of did it to generals. Let's be unreal here. Lances and axes kind of worthless. You don't really need to use them on anyone, uh, especially not uh, <laughs> especially not Hannibal. Uh, but this is funny. They can use all these. Um, actually, really good character for the arena if you're just trying to grind him up and get him levels and get some gold. Uh, he actually does really well at that because if you can use almost any weapon, then you can adjust for almost any arena enemy, any individual. You can just switch weapons whenever you want. Uh, particularly bows are very potent. Uh, because enemies in the arena will sometimes have weaker weapons at range. Uh, there's one particular matchup in the arena somewhere where you have to fight a Wyvern Lord, I believe. And if you fight him at range, you fight him with a Javelin. So you can make him switch from like a Brave Lance to a Javelin while also getting effective damage against him. And that is super funny. Um, he's pretty good at castle defense when your castle's ever under siege. It actually happens in the chapter he joined in, chapter uh, 9, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Uh, you get that three-headed dragon assault, or three-pronged dragon attack, or whatever it's called in the current translation patch. Uh, a bunch of dragon knights fly everywhere, and they'll try to like break down your castles. And if you just plop Hannibal one of those castles, it's not going down, because his defense is too high. I think the enemy dragon knights don't even attack you. And he even joins with a wing cleaper, just to you know, make sure you know what his purpose is in life, uh, so that he can defend one castle if you want him to. Uh, what I usually do, if I'm actually trying to not seize as soon as possible, but actually fight everything, is I'll probably have like my Forsetti user, or just a normal ass Sed on one castle, I'll have Shinan on another one, and I'll have uh, Hannibal on a third one, and uh, that way all castles are pretty much safe, and then it's just a matter of fighting Arion, which honestly you kind of want some of those characters that has his name for, uh, but that's one way to keep the castle safe. So that's what you can do. Uh, chapter 10 and final, there's not much of a need to have him here defend your castle. Uh, even if it does get assaulted uh, somehow, which can happen, I guess, depending on how you play it, he's not going to be the best at defending it. So you're better off having a better guard or no guard at all, or just making sure you don't need a guard at all. So beyond that, he doesn't really do anything. And similarly, a unit with five move like him is not going to be able to keep up with a giant army of units you have. You could make him keep up if you wanted to meme around with him, uh, like have uh, your mount staff user like Leaf uh, just rescue him across a bunch of mountains or like, across a bunch of terrain to keep him, have him keep up. Uh, you still be able to leg ring and a night ring to dance for him every turn. And then you could keep up, but you'll still go slower than you would at, at going at max speed. So I can't really say mobility is an issue. It's not like I have an infinite range warp to make up for it. And it's not like this combat is better than everyone else's anyway, because he does have high defense and strength and HP and everything. I think it's like 60 base HP, which is insane. 
but he has low res, which is pretty bad in Chapter 10 and beyond. And he has very low speed. He doesn't have Pursuit. He does have Adepts and Pavice, which is basically just a huge avoid boost for him. Uh, that's the way I see it. It's just a chance to just negate any attack completely. Uh, it's kind of a bullshit skill, but honestly, in FE4, if you can finally use that against the enemies, it's very satisfying after all those bosses with Great Shield themselves. So it's worth using him for that alone. It's being able to say, okay, Pavice, your Jormungandr didn't work. Uh, but that's all fun and memes. It doesn't really do anything. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put him... I, I could honestly argue he's worse than Aradon because Aradon has some free utility that I think is better. He might just be the worst in FE4, uh, but I love him. He's funny as shit. Uh, also, the beard, of course. This is... I, I try not to use the... Oh, this guy has a beard slash hat slash moustache. That's so amazing. Uh, automatic S-tier joke a whole lot because I don't think it's that funny after 10,000 times. But this is an amazing looking portrait. I love this artwork. It's so great. Uh, I think there was some good artwork of Hannibal by uh, Ipe, the guy that did like Daros for Ify Heroes uh, that features Hannibal. For some reason, he likes big, burly adult man, and this is just another one of those. Finally, uh, Corporal uh, just decided to put him in here because the only other unit that's on tier list maker is Arion, and he's not playable. So let's just wrap up FE4 right here and have a complete tier list. Um, so Corporal, son of Sylvia. Uh, often people will kill off Sylvia so they can get Charlo instead, as well as uh, Layla instead of Lean. Uh, I think oftentimes Charlo will be better than Corporal. Uh, but at the same time, I think Lean is a lot better than uh, Lean is a lot better than Layla uh, because I think Inheritance is actually important for the dancers, and you can make Corporal useful. Uh, it's actually recommended for ranked runs where you have to get everyone to level thirty to put Lex with Sylvia, like your your best combat unit, your, one of your best combat units, one of your Paragon users, put him with the two characters that have trouble leveling up just because getting everyone else to level 30 in the Gen 2 is pretty trivial. Uh, but getting these two to level 30 is almost impossible. So you might as well make, get them as far as possible using Paragon. But in most playthroughs, I think Corporal is kind of an afterthought. It's It feels like, okay, I have this character and I'm supposed to like staff spam to grind him up, but I don't really have a reason to because I already you already have like 20 different playable characters to move across the field. Maybe excluding a couple ones that you're not trading. And probably like four or five of them can already use staves. Uh, maybe not the level that he can use them because he'll probably have A rank or even S rank staff if Claude is his dad. Uh, but why would you raise his little priest over everyone else? Like his growths aren't even naturally any better than everyone else's because kids just have broken growths in general. That's just how Holy Blood works. So what's the point of raising him? And that's kind of a feeling I get with a lot of FE4 characters is they kind of just make each other like extraneous by existing and Corporal that's another thing it's like he's underleveled but because he's a staff unit he doesn't gain extra XP he just kind of gets XP at the slow ass rate that staff units always get and it's just it just doesn't feel good to use him he doesn't have good unit feel and that's what I feel about him and so using him is mostly about self-improvement like he has staff utility technically but you have units with more movement and, well, not more range, because all stats have 10 range or 1 range in this game. Uh, but there's no real benefit to using him. The only time when using Corporal is actually fun, I think, is when you have Forseti on him. Uh, the funny thing is, he actually inherits holy weapons like Forseti if they are passed down. He's actually one of the few units who can inherit two different holy weapons, uh, along with Set. He can get the Forseti and the Valkyrie Staff. Uh, Valkyrie Staff, he can use a base because he can just inherit S rank staffs from Claude uh, with the major uh, Holy Blood from Edda. I forgot what it's called. I think Valkyria, Valkyrie Blood. Um, but the uh, Force he can't use and promote it because he's joined as a priest and he needs to promote to a high priest in order to gain a wind direct that exists so that he can get S rank wind and use the Force Eddy. Uh, Force Eddy Corporal, actually kind of fun. Uh, he doesn't have any super amazing skills, uh, but he does inherit Adept and Miracle and Critical, so he's going to be like a, a budget set or a budget archer with him. Uh, not super fantastic or anything, he has like the lowest speed cap out of all of them, so his combat will probably be the worst out of them, but it's still four steady, it will still do. Uh, he'll still massacre just about everything as long as he dodges enough. Um, so he's still fun to use in that way, uh, but having to grind him up for, what is it, like 17 levels? Let me see real quick what his base level exactly is again, but it takes so much physics spamming to get him there. Uh, if he for Corporal, what's his base level at? What's his name? Care Prey? I always just call him Corporal, that's the old patch. Yeah, it's literally level 1. So literally 19 levels of grinding. That's not fun. Okay, uh, I'm gonna put this boy uh, like above Arden, I guess. Actually, I don't know. Maybe he's actually below Arden. Maybe it should be like this. No, yes, no. Paragon kind of good. Uh, Shadow has Berserk Staff, though, to his name. Corporal doesn't have that. Um, whatever, just put him like this. <laughs> I don't think anyone's gonna lose any sleep over this, so we'll just go with this. Had these boys stack up in, in the F tier. Honestly, Charlotte was also the cooler looking between the two. He's just mini Sigurd. That's way cooler. Uh, but yeah, that's the FE4 tier list. Complete it. 
Uh, I have a merge of tiers here yet, but honestly, I'm kind of happy with the B minus and A minus and S minus tiers existing. So let me know if you have any suggestions or alterations to do. I know Falcom is always on top of this one in particular because they have so much experience playing it before. Um, but I think it kind of turned out well. It's kind of like the, the mounted units and then the unmounted units uh, with some exceptions like the dancers over here. Uh, but that's just kind of the nature of a four inefficient play. So I think that fits. All right, uh, let's move on to FE7 because that's the first next up, not complete yet one, but it will be complete soon. All right, here we have FE7, three characters left. We have Pipler's submission of Bartre, Jonathan's submission of ba Wallace, and Letter Shield Mercenary's submission of Lin. That's all we got, and then we're done. I'm actually surprised that Lin ended up being the last character to be submitted. There's something poetic about that, considering my current FE6 playthrough. Uh, before we get to Lin, though, let's talk about Bartre and then Wallace. So, um, Bartre, I think we've discussed him a fair bit with Carla because that's how you unlock Carla. Um, Bartra has some early game utility and then kind of transitions into a character you don't want to deploy again for efficient playthroughs because his bases are not good enough and neither are his growths. Uh, mostly famous for having an awful three base speed, uh, needing a speed proc just to double zero AS enemies like soldiers and having trouble with doubling knights because they actually have like one, two, three AS on Hector Hard Mode. And of course some enemy types will double him like mercenaries, sometimes even cavaliers. It's just not pretty for him. And, you know, the High Might of Axis is nice, but Barter's base strength isn't that good to the point where you can one-shot enemies or even reach, like, higher damage threshold than other characters. Even if someone else isn't doubling, they're usually doing, like, similar-ish damage to Bartre. He has accuracy issues as well. Uh, really, the one redeeming factor to him is high HP, uh, high strength, and some early game utility. That's basically it for him. And you kind of have to hope that he gets a lot of speed. Now, you might not remember this, but I did an Iron Man uh, run for FE7 a long while ago, my first attempt at it, and in that one I got a really speedy Bartre. He got speed almost every level up in the early game. I think he missed 1 out of 10 in the early game. So he had a really fast Bartre going. Unfortunately, that run got short-circuited in Dragon's Gate, which is now my arc nemesis. I lost two Iron Mans there, and um, you know we're never going to see Speedy Bartre again. Uh, there's a really good highlight reel made by Yidus uh, with Bartre in it. Uh, but I do think Bartre, I don't think he has potential or anything, I'm not going to put it like that. Um, but there is something funny about using Warriors. I'm currently using Wade, who's basically prototype Bartre in FE6. He's also really slow and also pretty bad, uh, but there's something funny about these characters that I just can't let go. I just like high HP, low speed, high strength fighters. There's just something no nonsense about just having two stats and just kind of sticking with them. Uh, if you want to make Bartre good, uh, one thing you could do is just give them an A support with Doorcast. They have a Fire Thunder Affinity support, uh, which boosts their avoid uh, to the max, boosts their crit to the max, uh, gives them some attack to work with, some hit to work with, uh, mostly because of the fire affinity that uh, Dorakas has. Uh, Bartra is also one of the very few early game characters that supports Kanaz. In fact, he's the only one uh, when you think about it, and it's also very good support. It's Anima Thunder, so again, full avoid and full defense. Very welcome for both characters. So there are ways to make Bartra really strong. It just takes a long while. Uh, another funny thing about Bartre is he's a Hero Crest user. Now, Hero Crests themselves are a good promotion item to have in FE7 because there's not a whole lot of competition for them. Like, really, just Raven is the only good unit that wants one. So, chances are you're probably not using Bartre and Dorcas and Raven. And there are two relatively early available Hero Crests in casual playthroughs uh, one from Chapter 17, uh, the, the Raven chapter, and one from Chapter 19, no, 21. Uh, new resolve you can steal it from oleg uh, that one is hard to get in efficient playthroughs but in casual playthroughs it's fine so competition wise the promotion item is fine the problem with bartra specifically and all the hero crest users is that if you train them too much you can end up on a journey route which sucks you don't want to go to the journey chapter of pillflower of darkness you want to go to kenneth uh, that chapter is more fun uh, it can end quicker and it's just less miserable you can seize the throne instead of routing the whole map and having to open a bunch of doors it's way 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 better for you um, so if you train Bartra, you're actually going to have to train Gainer users more, which might not be a problem. The Gainer users are all pretty viable. Um, none of them are worse than B minus tier, I believe. I guess Sarah C minus, but even then, like she's whatever. She's I'm a C, not even C minus, so just C. Uh, but like Lucius, Urk, Kanas, they're all pretty good. Kanas doesn't count actually. Uh, Priscilla's pretty good too. So you can compensate for it, but it's just like a minor drawback to Bartra. Uh, but overall, not a character I would recommend using, uh, but has some early game utility. It can, if you hand access someone. It's not going to cost you anything. Uh, if he kills like a soldier that it would otherwise threaten one of your fragile units, that's fine. So in that sense, I put him like in the like around here somewhere maybe. 
or maybe somewhere close to here. Um, Dorkas' early game utility, I think, is significantly better because he has like three more speed up base and he's more sustainable. He, has, he actually does less damage, I believe. I think Bartra is a better strength base and also better growth overall. Um, so eventually, Bartra will end up out damaging and even out speeding Dorkas, but it takes a long time. I think that was one of the first things I discussed in Final Run Pitfalls is how Bartra is slower than Dorkas for the majority of the game. Uh, it also sucks that they don't get speed on promotion, by the way. Zero speed promotion sucks. They don't. They need that speed promotion from FA6 where they get like six HP and then like six skill or something. And then like two or three speed, it was quite insane. Uh, but FE7 promotion says, no, you don't get any speed. I'm sorry, Bartrick. Uh, you suck. Speaking of a lack of speed, we have Wallace. Um, I thought he was awesome when I first played the game because I was playing limb mode. And I was like, damn, this guy takes no damage from anything. Murders just about anything almost in one hit. Uh, awesome looking general. Use that Night Crest to become invincible. Every enemies can break their weapons upon him. Um, enemies, like, someone just smashes an axe into his bald head. And he's like, okay, no, zero damage. Rip. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Uh, nowadays, obviously not as favorable looking at Wallace. I generally don't even bother recruiting him because it makes me play the chapter that he's on for longer. I prefer to just kill uh, the Lloyd chapter, or kill Lloyd and end the Lloyd chapter ASAP. Uh, but if you do about, go about recruiting him, you are rewarded with a probably pre promoted general in uh, Hector Mode Chapter 25 that... I mean, he doesn't really die. Like, chapter 25 is a pretty good time for him to just show off how bulky he is. It's just he doesn't really accomplish anything while taking hits because he doesn't one-art anything uh, where your other characters are generally doing so. Uh, at that point, you have access to uh, reaver weapons, one to range weapons, uh, perhaps killer weapons if you're going to a secret shop somewhere or you just saved up a couple. And they'll just muster much better offense than Wallace can do. Uh, his, his speed isn't even that much worse than Oswin's relative to their level. Uh, but because he joins so much later, he's actually going to have a much worse speed stat than uh, Oswin at that point in the game. And you can also even die before you recruit him, which doesn't help his unit feel either. So pretty miserable unit to use if you're looking for efficiency. Uh, but if you're trying to do some funny strats, you can definitely do it. Like There were strategies that Don Don did uh, where Wallace was actually being used. Um, like, uh, he used him to wall off a general in Pale Flower of Darkness to, like, keep him busy and stop him from killing Merlinus and just generally stop him from doing anything uh, until he was ready to kill him because he didn't want to kill the general because he wanted to uh, get Harkin, which was only possible if he didn't kill the general because uh, he already killed the bishop and did the game constantly pretty much you kill. So he wanted to keep the general busy and have healing XP for Kanas. So he just kept getting Wallace damaged and, like, hitting the general with the Slim Lands and shit. It was just... It was a typical Wallace strat, basically. He's only useful for stuff like that. Um, there is a use for people like Wallace. There just isn't much of it. Uh, because there's no early game utility, I'm going to put him like below Rebecca, above Will, I guess. I think he's more useful than Will overall. Actually, Will has to, like the thing in his joining chapter. Let's put him here. This is all right. Uh, you can argue these like this whole bottom part besides maybe these three almost anywhere. You could even put Bart in F tier if you wanted to. I'm just going to delete the E tier. We don't need it anymore. We're never going to put any characters in him. So might as well just make this the E tier, I think. There's no one, no one going to be there. Okay, uh, finally, uh, Lin. Now, I did two, basically, waifu analysis on Lin uh, way back in the day, talking about why Lin is not very good in FE7. And um, that analysis stuck in my head for a long time, and it's what, it was what, it's what made me wonder how good she would be in FE6, which is the result of my, or like, that's what resulted into my current Let's Play of FE6, where I, I replaced Boars with Lin and tried to see how good she's in FE6. Because um, the traits that are good about her are not things that are in high demand in FE7. Uh, things like Manikari being effective, but only double effective because it's FE7. Uh, the Japanese version actually has a triple effective Manikari, uh, as well as every other effective weapon like Horse Slayer, and that really helps a lot, especially for Lin. So double effectiveness rather than triple effectiveness sucks. Um, the speed is overkill. Now overkill isn't bad, but it isn't much better than you know being good. Uh, you much rather have a bit more defense or a bit more HP than like having way overkill speed. Uh, but she's not fast enough to have reliable avoid. Uh, not being helped by the wind affinity if you're building supports either, so that doesn't help her avoid either. Um, Lock to swords is a really bad weapon type for FE6 because or for FE7. FE6 is better, uh, but for FE7 being locked to swords is pretty bad because the most common enemy type is lances. A lot of enemies have one to range, so you want to be able to use a hand axe or a javelin. Even if you're kind of bad at using them, it's still better than being able to use them and having some sort of way to counter enemies. Because, like, think about how Lin could fight like a room full of archers. Um, you wouldn't do it, but just as an example of like how inefficient she can be. If you had Lin fight a room full of archers with just four dudes, four archers, um, she would literally take four turns if she one rounds them. If she doesn't one round them, it's even worse. It's like eight turns in that case. Someone like Dorcas could stand in the entrance of that room and clear him in two turns because he just he just counterattacked them all and he would kill them in two turns. He might have to heal like vulnerability, but he can afford it. 
Uh, whereas Lin would actually be more fragile than Dorcas and would do a worse job at it. Uh, now, I'm not saying that you, fighting Arctis is the only thing that matters ever, uh, but it's a demonstration of how badly not having two range can really backfire on you. Uh, with all that in mind, Lin is also just not favorably fighting if you send him enemies. There's nothing that she really kills more efficiently than your better units do. Um, like Cavaliers maybe, because she doubles those with an effective weapon. Uh, but killing Cavaliers also isn't that hard beyond like chapter 21 or so when they slow down a lot. Almost everyone doubles them. So uh, in a sense, I would put Lin around like where Dorcas is, like D tier-ish. Um, there's like some stuff she can do occasionally that's helpful. Uh, sometimes the Manikari just comes in handy in a weird place where we don't expect it. Uh, there are some chapters where Lin is force deployed, where she can be actively helpful. Not many of them, because a lot of them are like defense maps where you don't really need her to do anything to get the lowest possible turn count. But, you know, if you train her, you have an extra unit for those chapters and that can be helpful at times. So I don't think she's completely terrible. Not irredeemable, uh, but one of the harder units to use FE, FE7. Now, if you want to defend her in the comment section, go right ahead. Um, I've been in that spot before. It's not pretty, but it's like a you know, a rite of passage in the final community to at least once defend Lin in the face of a tier list. <laughs> I've been there, trust me, I've been there. Uh, but yeah, that's the whole FE7 list. It's um, I've seen a lot of FE7 lists around my, uh, like, about my whole time in the internet, and I don't hate this one right now. It's looking pretty all right. Um, Marcus at the top is pretty obvious. And then everything else kind of falls into place, I think. There are some like stuff you can dispute, of course, but this is a list I would generally be happy with. Uh, maybe you put Heath in the same tier as Pence, maybe even above him, and just delete this A minus tier, because the tier for a unit on their own doesn't make a whole ton of sense. And uh, other than that, you know, I'm pretty okay with this. I could see some things moving around, but otherwise, I'm completely fine with this. Um, that's FE7. Let us move on to good old Path of Radiance. All right, let's do Path of Radiance. Now, this is truly Path of Radiance Ashnard edition because we have three characters that are pretty much in the game to fight Ashnard and not a whole lot else. We got Tabarn, Nasala, and Nasir, um, submitted by, let's see, Nasala was submitted by Yugo, Nasir was submitted by Cory, and uh, Potato submitted Tabarn. Thank you. And also, Potato, thanks for the mouse. It's really awesome. He gave me a mouse because he had one spare. And it was really nice. Okay. Um, so I looked into these units' performance against Ashnard because I think their performance against the rest of the enemies that they can fight in the game is not super relevant for the utility. They could help a little bit here and there. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how well they would do, uh, but their main purpose is probably fighting the final boss. And for me, the kind of characters these uses are mostly useful to prevent soft locks. Like, what if you didn't train the other units that are meant to take them on? In the case of Path of Radiance, that's pretty much just Ike. No one else can really take on Ashnar besides units that have some kind of blessing to break through the blessed armor that Ashnar has. And that includes the Dragon Lagoos, uh, the Ragnell, so Ike, and the Royal Lagoos, like Tabar, Nasala, and Gifka. We already tiered Gifka in a D tier, that should tell you roughly where they're going to end up. Um, I don't like any of these options, particularly against Ashnar, and for each, reason, each of them I'm going to explain it for a little bit. So... To Bard and Asana, their main problem is that they just don't do enough damage to Ashnar. They're just too weak. I did the math on their damage output, and I think they, they do outpace Ashnar's passive healing from Renewal, but only by a bit. I think he heals like 6 per turn, and Asana does like 4 times 2 because he doubles. To Bard doesn't even double, but he does like 10 damage per hit or something. It's not a whole lot. And Ashnar has like 60 HP, uh, even more in his second form, which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, so even if you're playing normal mode, where you have these characters available from the start, and they don't do that much damage. So I got to think, but I actually don't know for sure if Ashnar has worse stats in normal mode than he does in hard mode. Um, that's the other thing about Ashnar, he has two forms. And if you're playing Path of Radiance on hard mode, then uh, you don't even get to use them against Ashnar. Uh, you have to fight his first form without their help. So um, you're stuck with Hike pretty much. Ike and then one of your Dragon Lagoos and, uh, or Nasir. That's it. That's all you got. Um, there's nothing else that you can do to beat them. Um, so they're pretty bad fill saves for the first form, and for the second form they barely do any damage in the first place. So, um, kind of cringe, kind of bad. Um, I do like the Flying Lagoos a bit better than Gifka for other purposes, if you have found those. Uh, for example, in draft races, I think we were theorizing about using them to ferry Ike to the upper platform, because in draft races you're playing on normal mode, and Ashnar doesn't move in normal mode in his first form. So he'll just stay where he is, and that means Ike has to get up on the platform, and it's faster to do that with a flyer that can ferry him over there than it is to walk all the way around and use the stairs instead. That could be a place where they save time, and um, I mean, in, in a draft race, they save turns, which also saves time. 
So in that sense, I like him better for that. But Gift Guy is by far the best at fighting Ashnard uh, because he does more damage per hit. I don't believe he doubles. Uh, you would need to save some speed wings for him or to bar to double him. That's obviously not worth it. It's how it does double, but it just doesn't do enough damage. So auto utility, they're a bit better than Gifka. Uh, but for fighting Ashnard, I think Gifka is the best one because he does more damage. So I'm going to rate them mostly based on how to do it against Ashnard. So like this seems fine. I believe Tabarn is the one that does more damage. He also has better performance against other enemies, and he has Savior at base. So that's pretty cool. Okay, uh, then Azir. Uh, his performance against Ashard is a bit better. I uh, look at the stats. I don't think it gets doubled from the math I can do. Between transformation bonuses and Ashard's stats, I don't think he gets doubled. And he does some damage back. Not a whole lot, but enough to where like the chip could be helpful along with Ike. That's the other thing. They don't have to 1v1 Ashnar per se. Um, they could just help Ike fight him, but generally it doesn't do a whole lot, especially not if he moves around and does annoying stuff. Um, so the thing with Nasir though is you only get him if you manage to beat the Black Knight. And the only way to beat the Black Knight is by using Ike. And Ike has to be really good or really lucky to beat the Black Knight. So if you're meant to use the Dragon Lagoos as a way to fight Ashnard if your Ike is bad, but you unlock one Dragon Lagoos only through having a really good or lucky Ike, then Nasir just is never going to be useful. His raw stats are better than Anna's because of course they are he's supposed to be a reward for beating the black knight but he's never going to fight ashnard um or he's never going to be your sole option for fighting ashnard unlike anna Anna could actually be your lifesaver if you have a bad ike and you're playing hardcore you don't have the access to the to the royal agus uh that anna could save you um but if you have a really good ike then you don't need anna's here for anything at all like it's just completely superfluous he could still do some chip damage and help out but he's never really going to do anything significant so in that sense um, I kind of want to say Nasir is actually worse than Anna, even though Anna has like completely worse stats all around compared to Nasir. Like, I'm just gonna compare them real quick because I'm curious myself. Our stats are like worse in every single area, I believe. Yeah, I'm looking at the stats right now, particularly in speed. I think Anna actually gets doubled by Ashnard. She's like 19 speed compared to Nasir's 25. It's a pretty big difference, actually. So, if anything, they should be reversed. If you just got Nasir because you have a bad eye, I think that would make a much more sense. Of course, story wise, that would like completely change the way that chapter 27 works uh, but just looking at their stats like does he is better in every single area uh, by significant amounts too oh they tie in strength though so at least they do the same damage back to ashnard um but yeah uh i think i think this is worse between the two i don't think either of them do a very good job of fighting ashnard because they again they barely outpace his passive healing so as fill safes they're pretty bad too um, but they can at least have some utility. I still think they're better than Rolf overall, but I don't think they do a whole lot. Um, you could argue these kind of units arguing against like someone like Mia, uh, who is pretty bleh, but throughout the entire game, instead of bleh for like a couple chapters, you could argue that both ways, I think. So I'm just going to leave him as is here. And uh, yeah, that will be Path of Radiance. Uh, that's the whole tier list. It's kind of short entries, but these are like units that are around for a very short time. So there's not a whole lot to discuss. Uh, no progression here, no promotions. They just join and they can do a couple things, but not a whole lot. So uh, let me know if you think of the Path of Radiance tier list. I'm playing this game currently on my streams, my Iron Man streams, uh, using a couple of really, really, really unleveled bad units uh, to get through the game and a couple of really good ones. Um, surely learning some new things as I'm going along the way and I might change this tier list after I'm done with this Iron Man do some revisions on it uh, maybe with uh, someone else like I've done with Donna in the past and with Rangor I think those videos are very much fun to do uh, this with one of those games I want to revisit in that way but for now uh, this game is all wrapped up and uh, we're gonna head right into Shadow Dragon all right in Shadow Dragon I have three submissions actually four uh, Purim Pampoyi, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, submitted Media, but Media is already in the D tier, so uh, I decided to add an extra character to FE4 uh, instead, I added Corporal to that list to compensate a little bit, so we have the same amount of characters this this, this month, and then next month, uh, if you're still a Patreon, you can just submit someone else if you want to. So, um, we have Frey, submitted by M Wilson 96 we have Boots42 for <laughs> Boots submissions of Edsel and Nagi for this one. And that's going to be it. That's going to be the whole vid. So uh, Frey is interesting to rate in the context because this has mostly been assuming hard 5 as the difficulty. But um, Frey is not available in hard 5. He's only in normal mode. So for a second, I'm just going to assume right here that we're playing hard 5, but Frey is somehow available. Uh, for example, there is a content patch that allows you to recruit Frey and Norn in Shadow Dragon uh, while also playing all the Guidance chapters without having to kill off characters because that's how you unlock Frey and Norn. 
Um, Alright, that's how you unlock Norn in normal mode, is killing off characters. And Frey, you don't have to kill anyone else, particularly in normal mode, but you do have to play normal mode and kill someone off in the prologue to get through to the main game. Uh, this is kind of how the story is. You don't have to kill off Gordon or sacrifice one of your other characters. You know, that point where everyone sacrifices Jake, and even though they shouldn't, that one. Um, so Frey, as far as I can tell, is basically identical to Abel in almost every aspect. Um, down to weapon ranks, they both have D swords, or they both have D e, e, <laughs> e swords and D lances. So they're able to get the horse slayer pretty much um, when you, whenever you want to. I believe the content patch also allows you to play the prologue, if I'm not mistaken, so that could get you an extra lance rank on Frey. Uh, but either way, getting to Riders Bane in time for it to be relevant is pretty easy with these kind of characters. And then uh, Frey has plus one strength up base, minus one speed compared to Abel. So they're almost identical, their growths aren't even that different. Um, Frey has like slightly higher speed growth, slightly higher strength growth, um, like 35 strength to Abel's 40%, uh, 55 speed to Abel's 50%. So really small differences, less than like the Aphis drops in FE7. So really not worth arguing over uh, these base differences. And he should just be in the same tier, the same category, the same place almost as uh, Abel's farm type concerned. Uh, which one is better? I have no idea exactly. Uh, if I had to pick one, if you like put a gun to my head and force me to pick one, uh, I guess I would say Frey is slightly better because he has a higher strength base. I don't remember exactly what kind of doubling thresholds Abel can or cannot reach, uh, whether you can reach the thresholds to um, like avoid getting doubled somewhere or not. Uh, but I have a feeling the strength threshold of one can make a big difference because early game one damage can be the difference of killing and not killing a lot more often than one speed can be. Uh, that I mean, I know Kane is like on the cusp of getting doubled, so maybe I'm overestimating uh, how much, or maybe I'm underestimating the speed difference. Uh, but I'm pretty sure Kane actually has the same speed as Kane. So, uh, but it really depends what his prologue chapters in this like hypothetical scenario, right? Because in those he could get a speed point and he'd be like faster than Kane. Uh, whereas Kane doesn't really have time to level as much in Prologue, as far as I remember. Uh, but it's been a long while. I don't think there's a really big difference with the Cavaliers either way. Uh, the biggest difference is the Lance rank uh, that Kane doesn't have. He has E Lances, they have D Lances. So, uh, yeah, this is how I would tier them personally. You put Frey on top, he seems pretty good. Uh, I did use him in my FE11. 100% crit LTC, which is a very old series of videos, but it does exist on my channel still. And I believe I've raised both Frey and Abel to uh, Draco Knights. Uh, that's one cool thing about the Cavaliers in Shadow Dragon, is they can become Draco Knights after promotion. You just run the Paladin and then reclass it to Wyverns, because that's a class that unlocks after promotion. Um, girl characters can reclass the Pegasus Knight before promotion and get flying access then, uh, but males have to wait after. Uh, but they still get all the juicy bonuses from Draco Knights, like the huge bonus in strength and speed. And defense. Uh, the bonuses aren't as big actually. I think they just um, they just become really good at it. Uh, but they have like higher stats in those kind of areas to begin with. I think their prone bonus might be slightly smaller. But either way, Jericho Knight, fantastic class. Even though you cannot rescue drop anyone in this game, uh, you can still skip so much terrain and get such a good positional advantage over enemies that flying is just worth it overall. You can outrage ballistas. Just one thing they can do. Just outrage ballistas, uh, get closer to them and kill them like that. Pretty cool. Okay, it looks like when I was recording this, I accidentally slipped uh, Edsel into the F tier by accident below Rad somehow. And because of that, I skipped him in the initial recording. So I'm just going to tier him now when I'm editing this. And then we're going to, you know, paste that in somewhere. And you're going to see uh, Edsel magically be in F for the rest of the video. But don't worry, he won't be. I'm not going to put him in F because he's actually pretty good. Um, he's one of those guide only characters that was invented for Shadow Dragon that was not in the original FE1 or FE3. Uh, you get him in chapter 12x, so if you have 15 or less, or like less than 15 characters alive at the end of chapter 12, then you will automatically go to 12x. Uh, I've said before about the Shadow Dragon guidance that I think they're a bit misunderstood by the fan base at large. Uh, completionist players often want to play the entire game, including guidance chapters. And, you know, it makes sense considering that in previous entries, guidance chapters were usually additions to the main plot that were intended to be played. You know, they were kind of part of the story, not completely, like they were, they were obviously, obviously skippable, so they, they couldn't be obligatory. Uh, that's the whole thing of a Gaian chapter, is you're not forced to play them. Um, but the idea of Gaian chapters in Shadow Dragon, on the other hand, is not for completionist players to have an extra chapter to play, but rather for players who are really struggling to keep people alive, give them an extra chapter to get a good character, and trade their units a bit more on easier enemies, because the enemies are clearly a lot weaker then you find in main chapters, especially on higher difficulties, I believe the difference is very noticeable. Uh, normal mode, hard one in Shadow Dragon, I think the enemies are pretty weak to begin with. But you know what, for a beginning player, uh, they might still appear pretty strong because newer players, 
they're not as they don't have the habit yet of like checking every weapon on every enemy uh checking how well they do in combat they might not read the battle preparation screen or the battle forecast correctly all that stuff so these kind of chapters are pretty helpful for them and it's kind of unfortunate that they stopped doing this kind of content i understand why because people clearly misunderstood and didn't like it like they, they felt like you had to kill off characters to get to these chapters uh, but it's more like if you're good enough to keep your characters alive, then you probably won't need these chapters anyway. So there's no reason for you to play them. As a result, these chapters are kind of lackluster and not all that much fun for more advanced players, I find. At least personally, I don't really enjoy these chapters very much. And I usually just skip them when I'm playing Shadow Dragon. I think on my last playthrough of Shadow Dragon, which was an Iron Man playthrough, I don't think I visited a single Guidance chapter, uh, but I appreciate that they're there. So um, Etzel in 12x he joins you at like the end of it so you can't use him throughout but he is pretty good after you get him he is a sorcerer with i would say like middling speed not enough to double anything on the harder difficulties but enough to double like armor knights at least if you want him to uh, i think he has enough base rank to use excalibur because he's got b and tomes and i'm pretty sure that is something he can do just double check that yep uh, he's got b rank million units only so not a whole lot of competition over it uh, american use it at e but Edsel can use it as b because it's a b rank tome uh, that's pretty good, means you can one kill most flying enemies um, pretty easily from range 2, so pretty safe. Uh, not that he's going to miss, because that's kind of so good. You can also use staves. Uh, this is where, if you're playing slow enough to play to get guidance, uh, or rather, if you're not going at a super fast pace, which you probably aren't if you accidentally stumble into a guidance, then you probably have enough time to get Edsel to a higher staff rank and get to C, which can be helpful because it gets you Physic and Warp. Uh, warp skipping, probably not really on the agenda for newer players, but it can be very helpful to just have that mobility boost, even if you're not actually skipping chapters. Being able to transport units around for the entire map, uh, like let's say you have Setgar alive and you want him on the other side of the map suddenly because there's an emergency, a bunch of reinforcements came out, uh, you want him to handle those, you can use Edsel to warp a Setgar over there and take care of business. Maybe warp needs to be, maybe Marth needs to be warped out of there uh, because he's in trouble, you can use warp for that as well. It has applications beyond just uh, skipping chapters. You could just have, like, warp a thief towards a treasure room that a thief is going to beat you to because you had trouble making it in time, all that kind of stuff. Uh, getting the arm staff, for example, pretty difficult without a warper, but with a warper, pretty easy. So that's the kind of stuff you would use Warp for. And then Physicus is a nice durability increase for like people that are out there fighting, but you don't want to put Edsel nearby because he might get hurt. Um, so normally it would take a really long time to get from D to C at this point in the game for a more efficient context, because uh, you have to do, I think you get two weapon XP per staff use in this game, regardless of what you do. Uh, same for combat. And he needs 45 weapon XP to go from D to C. So that's going to be 22, 23. Uh, staff uses. That's not really realistic when you start warp skipping. So he's probably not going to be a warper in an efficient playthrough. And because of that, he doesn't really have anything to do for those kind of playthroughs, he just kind of... I don't even know what he'd do. He probably can help with Excalibur chips somewhere, and that's about it. Uh, his bases are reasonably good. He probably cannot really be anything besides a sorcerer in this game. Uh, it's not like in FE12, for example, where you can make him a, a sword master, give him level sword, have him go to town. I think sorcerer is his only class. Uh, it's unfortunate a bit for him that he is in the B class set for males instead of A. Uh, if he was in the A set, he would have access to Sage and Bishop. So let's say he in an alternative universe, he would be a Sage. Uh, you could reclass the Bishop, get some extra staff rank that way. That option doesn't exist for Edsel. His alternative classes are like Berserker, Warrior, uh, Hero, General. All these classes he can't really do anything with. Um, but, you know, if you're just going at a chill pace, then Edsel's pretty good for just doing chip damage, healing your units... Uh, perhaps one round of killing some armor knights or some flyers with Excalibur. Uh, just pretty flexible overall. Um, and of course, it looks like an ass, so it's really cool. Uh, I would, like, for a more casual playthrough, I put him, like, somewhere up here. Uh, for a more efficient playthrough, he's obviously kind of worthless. Um, I don't think he has anything to do in an actual efficient playthrough. Uh, maybe if you're, like, doing a warpless run, then he could be kind of good, I guess, but not really even. Uh, I do think he's significantly better in the mid game at you know doing things so i guess i'm just gonna like put him above linde and call it a day uh i do actually think that goto and tiki if you're going like actual ltc or you know being super efficient they're probably significantly better uh but it feels weird putting him below linde uh, i do think he's better than her like he joins like two maps later with significantly better stats i think excalibur utility is better than aura utility especially considering etzel can actually take a hit from some enemies so i think this is like honestly it should be maybe, maybe tier over linde but you know, Linde has some uses in efficient playthroughs, whereas you're probably never going to, like, recruit Edsel, let alone really make use of him when he joins. Like, even that 
to wish chapter stretch where it only exists where Edsel doesn't might just be a big deal. Um, but you know, let me know what you think. Um, so yeah, uh, it's gonna look like he's an F tier for the rest of the video, but trust me, he's not. He's that good. Uh, thanks for submitting. Uh, then we have Nagi, uh, another character that's only really useful against the final boss of the game and not a whole lot of other places. Um, I've come around on Tiki versus Nagi when it comes to Matthias fighting uh, for Iron Man playthroughs. I generally think that Tiki is better at it if you want to play the safest way possible. So the, the whole thing about beating Medius is a bit complicated, so let me just try to summarize it. So Medius is only really weak to Dragonstones and the Thalkion, and the Thalkion is only usable by Marth and has like specific things to unlock. And in addition, Marth is not very good at fighting Medius because Medius has a speed of like 30, I believe, and Marth caps out at 25. So no matter what you do, Marth is going to be dying to Medius in one round if you fight him with him, unless he finishes off Medius. But that's risky, especially for an Iron Man. If Marth misses, you're just screwed. All right. Um, so what you often do is you use one of the mana keys to fight Medius and you can unlock them both with a glitch, but generally you won't. You only have one of Tiki and Nagi. Um, and then uh, Tiki starts off worse than Nagi at base, but becomes better if you raise her. And 20x is a pretty good opportunity to raise Tiki, actually, uh, or 24x, I should say, the chapter you unlock by having Tiki dead and um, also not having the Falcon, which is easy to accomplish because not getting Falcon is the play. <laughs> like, you don't want to actually get the Falcon. You could if you wanted to, though. Um, it's like you can. Uh, you have these two spheres, the Star Sphere and the Light Sphere, and you can bring them to Goto in a village in a chapter, and then you can get the Starlight Tome, which can be used to defeat Garneth, who drops the Falcon, uh, which you can then to give to Marth. But if you don't bring those spheres to him, you can keep the Star Sphere and the Light Sphere around and use those to uh, your advantage to repair your weapons or keep them at full uses and just have very powerful characters um, compared to if you just handed those spheres in. If you do have the spheres in though, and you get the starlight, you can beat Garneth with them, sure. Uh, but you don't really get a whole lot of benefit from it in gameplay, as far as I can tell, besides beating Garneth for uh, story points. Um, okay, but let's say you, you want to use Nagi. Uh, the best way to use her is probably to warp her to the Medius, uh, attack Medius with Nagi. Uh, Nagi will probably die in the counterattack because she gets doubled by Medius, and Medius just kind of destroys everything that touches him because he's that powerful in hard five. And then you can revive her with the arm staff and warp her in and do it again. Uh, you can also do that with Tiki if you wanted to, um, but it also works with Nagi. Uh, there's a glitch you can do to let both Tiki and Nagi be alive, and then you won't have to use the Alm Staff. Uh, what you can do is, uh, I think you give Tiki the Falcon, uh, kill her off in like 24, and then you get to 24x, uh, but then you just revive uh, Tiki. Now, the game doesn't think you have the Falcon because it was in Tiki's inventory when she died. Um, but you actually do get it back because items cannot be lost in Shadow Dragon. They end up in your convoy again. That's the way you can get both mana keys. Uh, there's a lot of different like little configurations you can do. Uh, I personally, my favorite way to kill Medius is just using a really giant Forge Ballista uh, to kill him with like a crit or something. That seems kind of fun to do. Uh, but the mana keys are a pretty good way too. There's no super reliable way of killing Medius. I mean, it exists if you just turtle through the whole, whole chapter and block the reinforcements, I guess. Uh, but the fastest and easiest and most efficient way and most reliable-ish way to do it is a warp skip of some sorts. Okay, uh, where does that leave Nagi? Uh, probably about as far as Tiki goes. Tiki has some utility. I'm trying to find Tiki while I'm talking shit, but I'm not having a whole lot of luck with that. Uh, she's in CT apparently. Uh, so that's probably where I put her, like around like where Goto is. Uh, Goto can like help warp uh, Tiki over to Medius. Uh, Nagi can be the Medius killer. Uh, Tiki can do like a couple of things before uh, they're around. I think she can boss kill, help kill Michaelis, for example, with some semblance of liability, uh, but not necessarily like, a great deal of utility. Uh, Nagi is pretty much only useful for that entire bit with Medius, and that's about it. Uh, so basically the same character as Goto in that regard. Uh, Goto can help you, like, if you're turtling through the last chapter, uh, you can use Goto for, like, fortify, physic. Um, I don't, you can't hammer earn, because uh, that's, like, Lena only, but those are the best staffs anyway and he can also use swarm which he comes with so that's i think he allows for more different ways to beat endgame goto does um and overall more reliable but just very slow ways which wouldn't really count for an efficiency playthrough so maybe Nagi's is actually better than to goto in that way because he doesn't really do a whole lot besides warping tiki um whereas nagi is like one of the people who gets warped i guess they'd be like equivalent in that case but you can warp tiki with someone else you don't have to use goto for it whereas nagi is like one of two only outs, whereas you might have more warpers, I guess. Um, very technical stuff. I also think Linda is worse than both, honestly. I think Linda should be below these both. That's kind of how I view it. That's kind of how I view Shadow Dragon. Um, there are more Shadow Dragon characters available still. Um, I'll post screenshots of every single game that hasn't been completed yet. 
for the next Patreon post, post so that it's very easy to tell who has been submitted, who hasn't been. Uh, I've been doing that for the last two times. So if you missed it last time, check it out again. Uh, you can see who has been tiered and who has not been tiered. Uh, everyone in the to be done tier or below in that little patch below, I can show it here. Uh, everyone in this area has not been tiered yet. So you can submit those if you're one of my Patreons. Um, thanks everyone so much for submitting the characters. Uh, thanks for completing FE7 and FE4 with me, uh, as well as getting closer to completing the other games. Thanks for completing FE9 as well, uh, Path of Radiance. And you know, just in general, thanks for watching and being awesome. Um, stay cool, and I will see you next time for the next batch with New Mystery, Awakening, and Fates. Peace, goodbye, love ya.